Hi, Suzanne Jakes here, Marketing Coordinator for Unique Training and Development with Kirk Langford, our General Manager, for another Leader Feeder episode. Hello, Kirk. How Hi, are you today? I'm good, Suzanne. How are you doing? Good. Always good. <laughs> um, today we're talking about uh, how to increase employee retention. Now, mm -hmm. I feel like this is going to be a big subject for a lot of mm -hmm. organizations, right? Because yeah, it's, sure. it's sometimes tough keeping skilled employees, it right? It is. It absolutely is, yeah. So I'm going to start off with an easy, maybe a quick, maybe a long question here. <laughs> Never know and, with me. Well, <laughs> right? <laughs> but why would employees leave a company? Mm. And like, like, and I imagine that this would impact productivity and other things along the board, mm -hmm. but what are some main yeah. reasons, in your opinion, yeah. why an employee would leave an organization? Yeah. So a couple, I mean, there's a couple that right off the bat are pretty obvious if they feel like they're not being compensated fairly, right? So if their pay, mm -hmm. their salary isn't what yep. they want it to be, that seems to be, I'm sure we could all agree that's one of the big ones is pay. Um, I think another one is is the environment, right? So, for example, if they're in a toxic work environment or toxic work culture, um, they might eventually feel like, you know what, I've had enough. So, whether it's their boss that they feel like treats them unfairly or maybe has favorites on the team and they're not one of the favorites, um, it could be uh, just the other coworkers are not treating them nicely or in a way that they that they want to be treated, and their leader isn't stepping in to help. Right, their manager isn't intervening and saying, "Okay, this has to stop." So for whatever reason, I mean, a toxic work environment could come about lots of different ways, but we do see that, and and I think that's one of the other big reasons people tend to leave. So lack of pay or a sufficient pay for what they want, adequate pay, and I think a toxic work culture. I think um, a lack of sort of motivation and lack of engagement is another big one. So it's not necessarily that toxic work culture. It's not that I'm being, you know, harassed or something. It's not that my coworkers are mean to me or bullying me. It's just I just kind of lost interest. I don't want to be here anymore. Right. I don't find this particularly motivating. I don't find it particularly exciting or engaging. I do think that's something we see uh, a bit more in manufacturing than we might see in other industries because it can be repetitive work, it can be um, a lot of the same thing, and if you're working on an eight or a 10 or a 12 hour shift doing relatively repetitive uh, motions or tasks, that can really uh, sort of hit on your motivation, right? It can be challenging mm -hmm. to stay really motivated putting this part onto this part, for example, or just to, uh, you know checking on this product as it comes through the line. Yep. So I think that's part of it, uh, or rather those are some some parts of it, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, those would probably be the biggest ones that I can think of. So, you know, I go back to uh, I go back to pay, I go back to a toxic work culture, mm -hmm. and then that lack of motivation or engagement. And sometimes that lack of motivation or engagement happens very quickly. It can be the first couple shifts, they just don't go well. The right. leader doesn't do much to make the employee feel welcome and involved. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of go, well, why would I want to be here if this isn't very engaging? Other times it can be you've done a job for five, six, seven years or whatever, and you start to go, I'm tired of it. I'm ready to move right. on to the next Same challenge. Old stuff almost. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's where probably the last reason I'll give would come in, which is a, a lack of, of um, mobility. And by mobility, mm -hmm. I mean either it could be, and I, you'll notice I didn't say upwards mobility. It's because we're seeing more of, it doesn't have to be all about promotions. It doesn't all have to be up. Oh, it's not okay. always about going up the well, ladder. I was wondering what you meant about up. Yeah, okay, yeah. it might be lateral. It might be, I want to work in a oh, different department. I just want to try different tasks. I want to try a different machine. Um, we're seeing a lot more people saying, I don't necessarily want to become a manager. I don't want to become a leader in that sense, but I would like to try new things and be challenged in a different way and be compensated fairly for it. Right. So those are the big ones that I would say are causing employees yeah. or would cause employees to those lose. Those are some big things I think that, yeah, everybody mm -hmm. can maybe yeah. relate to whether yeah. they've left a, a place or not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You brought up a couple specific um, points in there, mm -hmm. which one was favoritism mm -hmm. um, yeah. and whether maybe you as a leader do or do not know that um, you're playing favorites. Sometimes it's the... Yeah. The people on the team perceiving that you're yes, playing favorites. Very much so. How could a leader tackle that? Yeah, that's. A, I mean, that's a good point. I, it, it, the the word you brought up that I think is important is the perception. The perception mm -hmm. of favoritism. We've worked with lots of clients, and uh, one of the things we've seen is you can either be playing favorites because maybe you were promoted from within, so you are now, you know, and you go from being one of the team to the leader of the team, and so it's very natural in that setting to pick favorites. And you don't, I don't think you actively pick them as much as you kind of stick to the people that you know the mm. best and that you trust the most, and you pick them for certain tasks. Mm, Rachel's good at that. That's and right. Bobby's, yeah, exactly. Bobby's great at this. Yeah, I, yeah. I already know he likes that job because he told right. me. Uh, you know, 
know when we were coworkers. So now you are playing favorites, right? Mm. But the perception of playing favorites could also be this. Check out this scenario. So, you know, Suzanne, you're really reliable. You always do everything I ask. You never complain. You get the work done. I just love working with you. So when there's a new task that needs to be done, and if I sense there's going to be any resistance from the team, if I sense it's difficult, if anything like that, what do I do? I go, I'm going to ask Suzanne to do it. And that could be me. What I may be trying to do is I'm actually trying to spare the rest of the team from some of the hard work. I'm trying to spare the team from things that they might not like or might not mm -hmm. enjoy mm -hmm. because I know you'll get it done and I know you'll say yes. But in fact, my team is going, why does Suzanne get to try all the new stuff? We, we would take on new challenges if we were asked or why is she the golden child? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, again, there's that perception of favorites. I see it as I'm trying to save my team from, you know, tasks they might not like or particularly difficult task. But it could very easily be perceived by my team as um, Kirk prefers Suzanne. Yeah. And therefore, he gives her all the, all the challenges and, you know, the chance for her to be promoted is way higher because, she, you know, she gets yeah. to try all these things. So yeah. that's where the perception piece is important. And then Suzanne's sitting there thinking, oh, my gosh, Kirk just gives me all these jobs I all get the all time the extra where I have work. to learn all this <laughs> yeah. new stuff. I mean, that's right. Well, it could be a negative side effect. But I think it eventually becomes be, that way. It could, eventually could be, gets to yeah. be seen as, why is it always me that's getting picked to do all this right. stuff? Why can't anyone else on the team be relied on? Mm -hmm. So it can actually generate frustration, not only for those on the team that aren't getting picked to do the work, but actually for Suzanne, who's being asked to do all of this extra work all the time. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of combating that, I do think one of the, um, I suppose, easy ways, if you want to if you want to look at it that way, is to maybe even have a chart and say, each time I have an extra task or something different or new, um, having essentially a checklist to go or a list of names and go, who, who did I ask last time, right? Could I go to, okay, I asked Suzanne last time, could I go to Bill and say, Bill, got this extra task, I, I want to ask you first um, if you're interested. No, okay, if not, I'll go to the next person. Or even just asking people, saying, mm -hmm. uh, hey guys, we have this extra job, the line, the line is down and we have to do what we can to get it back up, who can help me? Right? Let people uh, volunteer themselves. Mm -hmm. Because maybe you will put up your hand, because you're still that go-getter and you might put up your hand right away, but someone else that I didn't expect might also put their hand up. Yeah. And now I'm going, oh, okay, there are people on the team that I didn't really know were up for taking on a challenge. Right. And now, because I asked, instead of just deciding who was going to do it without any consultation from the team, I might be open, opening my eyes as the leader to, oh, my team is more ready to yeah. take on other challenges than I expected. So Absolutely. that's the way you can avoid favoritism. I like the idea of a chart. Mainly because I do like spreadsheets and charts myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I do like that Helps idea. Helps keeps it organized. Yeah, it keeps yeah. it organized and, and visuals right. are always good for, yeah. for me too. Yeah. Uh, another specific one that you brought up was rotation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, sorry, maybe it wasn't quite rotation, but you talked about the lack of is why someone yeah. might leave is because That's they're right. just doing the same job right yeah. day in and day out. So um, I've heard you say before, charts can also help mm -hmm. with that too, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And maybe you want to explain it to, to our yeah. listeners yeah. about um, how you can uh, cross-train, I believe yeah, that's you say, right. or yeah, rotation. Yeah, cross-training, yeah. yeah. So really what that is, is you take you would take a very simple chart and list uh, the people on your team in one, uh, you know, down uh, the column, and then of course the tasks that need to be done in on the rows, along the rows rather. And then you're just going to say, okay, who can do what? Well, Terry can do this, and Rosemary can do this, and Brian can do this. Okay, great. Now here's now I have a list of who can do what. Mm -hmm. Now I need to figure out um, which tasks I want other people to be able to do. So maybe Rosemary can do X and Y, but she can't do A and B, and I want I want her to know how to do that, right? So then I know which tasks she can do. I know which ones she can't do, so I now know what I want to train her on. And I can do that for all the members mm -hmm. on my team. Because what I know is as a leader, the more people I have on my team that are trained to do different tasks, the more, the, the better I'm able to be uh, adaptable in an emergency. And not just me, but rather my team. Right. So if something happens, <clears throat> if I go, well, it's okay that Suzanne's on vacation. I got three other people that can yeah. do that particular task. It doesn't cause, you know, chaos or havoc if someone's not available or something happens where I need to switch uh, and rotate people. Right. Yeah. No, that's no. great. Another point. Um, I do like the cross training because mm. I do think that within organizations, um, just having a variety of work is important yeah. as well, right? Like, That's yeah, right. then you don't have to go in and do the same thing day in and day yes. out. Um, you can, you can get, and you get to the opportunity to learn new things, which mm -hmm. is always a yeah. lot of fun. Uh, you'd also brought up onboarding. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, in my head, you didn't say those specific words, but in my head, it came in as onboarding. As yeah. like, did you welcome new members? Um, That's right. So when we talk about retention and how to increase employee retention within your workspace, yeah. um, onboarding came to mind when you'd said, you yes. know, a welcoming environment. Yes. Um, what else can 
can leaders or organizations do to make sure that they have a uh, good onboarding process for yeah. these new employees to make sure that they'd want to stay? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, the first thing, honestly, have a process. Actually set up a checklist. You know, I have one myself for, so that when we hire someone, uh, I make sure that I hit on certain things and that everybody's getting the same, not the same treatment per se, but that I'm not forgetting certain things for some employees because it can be a frustrating thing if you're new uh, to, you know, go to do something for the first time and ask the boss, hey, I'm wondering about this or I've been asked to do this and I'm not really sure. Oh yeah, sorry, I was supposed to train you on that and I forgot. That's a really frustrating experience, mm -hmm. right? If you have that checklist in place, for either different roles or maybe there's certain things that apply to anybody on your team. There probably are, right? Usually there would be. Um, making sure everybody gets consistent on an, a consistent onboarding experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the first thing is just have a list. Write down all of those things you think about. What do I need to do each time someone comes on? And it's not just... Um, it's not just the task. Uh, the task. It's not just give them a key and give them right. a security code and give them the email login. It might be other things like uh, introduce them in the company newsletter. It Ooh. might be uh, give them a walk around of the floor and introduce them to the different departments. Personally, right? Personally, yeah. Things that are not just about getting them set up so they can do the work, but actually things that make them feel welcome. Right. Greet them at the That's door. Right. Yeah, yeah, greet them at the, the door on the first day. day. Make sure that the whole mm -hmm. team, uh, maybe maybe invite them to eat lunch with the team on the first day if that's possible, yeah, right? Absolutely. Things that make them go, oh, I already feel, maybe not part of the team right away, but I feel like this team actually wants me to be here. Um, they, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but there, there, you know, has been research done that sort of says that people have already decided within their first couple of shifts whether this is a job they would want to stay at for years and years, or or whether it's going to be a short term thing. And so that's pretty powerful to think about that. That within the first couple of shifts, you are making or breaking whether that person's going to stay. And and in one way, you could look at that as stressful because as a leader, going, oh god, these first couple of shifts really matter. I can't mess this up. But I actually think what it means is that let's front load. Their po the positivity of that beginning of the experience. Let's make sure they're introduced to the team. Let's make sure we learn their name and we use it often and teach the rest of the team their name. Mm -hmm. You know, let's make sure that we make those couple, uh, especially the first couple, but as much as we can, um, a positive experience so that they're mm -hmm. saying, I like this place. It's a cool place. Puts sort of a good taste in their mouth. And Maybe I'll stay a while. Yeah, yeah. It kind of goes back to that that thing of like first, first impressions are really important, mm -hmm. right? And so the same thing applies. And so when we talk about retention, we absolutely need to talk about making a good first impression. And I honestly think it just starts with a list. Right. And like I said, the other thing about that list is that it shouldn't just include the tasks that get them the login and get them the this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, take care of it, get them the payroll information. Yes, of course, you got to do all that. But you also have to think about what can I make them do to actually feel welcome. Right. Right. Oh, great points. Yeah, I thanks. love all of those. That's a really great. Something that popped into my mind while you were chatting there and listing off those amazing things that mm -hmm. anybody I believe can take away from that mm -hmm. um, is recognition programs. Um, now we kind of, well, I shouldn't say we kind of, because I have heard um, positives and negatives mm -hmm. to kind of recognition programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, say someone has stayed on with you for a while and you now, you know, like, what is your take, I guess, is mm. what I want to ask <laughs> on recognition programs. Because, yes, I have heard um, they're good. I've heard they're bad. Yeah. I've heard people like them. I've heard some people don't like them. Yeah. Do you have an opinion? I have an opinion on everything. So don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think they can be good when they're used effectively, right? Okay. So what I mean by that is having, you know, a, a bit of a recognition for somebody being there for 10 years or 5 years or 20 years, I think that's great because you mm -hmm. want to show that we care that you've stuck around. We appreciate that you've stuck around as long as you have. I think that's fun, mm -hmm. fantastic. I don't think that should take the place of... Uh, of other appreciation and acknowledgement, so acknowledgement for a job well done, uh, making sure that positive reinforcement and positive feedback is provided. So it's not sort of, well, Ben, I didn't, I didn't really say much to you this month because you got that 20 year award last year. I mean, you've been here 20 years. What more, do, what, you still want positive feedback? Come on, dude. Mm -hmm. No, you still have to get that. So I guess it's as long as the recognition isn't taking place of other positive acknowledgement and positive feedback, I think it can be really successful. And I think it shows that as a company, if it's something you're celebrating and measuring and talking about, it's clearly something you care about, right? So 
if you um, are highlighting that, then I think it's because it's important to you as a company or as an organization. So yeah, I think it can be really positive. It's just got to be used in the right way like anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So we've talked about a lot of things actually like mm -hmm. um, good onboarding, um, competitive wages, yeah. uh, positive work environment, which right. is huge, uh, recognition programs, and, and even you touched base a little bit on work-life balance, which is uh, important no matter, mm -hmm. no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing that kind of came to mind, maybe the final thing that we'll talk about today, mm. um, are transparent management practices. Mm. Um, so it, that's something that can influence, influence, I suppose, employee retention. But um, being transparent as in like open and all these yeah. things does, I think, kind of just compiles all of those. Does it not? Like yeah, when you I say think to a large transparent extent, yeah. Yeah, management practices, um, would kind of, yeah, encompass a lot of the things that we talked about today mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. um, but was there anything else that maybe little tidbit of information or last quick things that are mm -hmm. popping into your head um, that could help organizations increase employee retention? Yeah. I think when we go back to talking about transparency and transparent management, I think as leaders, it's very easy to think that we're leaders because we have a certain control or power or authority that other people don't have. But I would argue if you think you have that, if you need that power, that control to be the boss, then you're a boss, not a leader. I think a leader is a leader because they often, people follow them even though they may not be the official boss, right? A lot of you are listening to this and you're thinking of who's that person in the organization where they may not be your direct manager, but you go to them. You go to them with questions, concerns, and even though they're not your manager, they just have an answer and they have a way of helping you get through the problem or think about it um, in, in, in an open way that doesn't, that doesn't sort of show I'm more knowledgeable than you, but they just have a way of being collaborative that way. That to me is a leader, right? Just because someone is your boss on paper, it doesn't naturally make them a leader. And so I think when we talk about transparent, transparent management, I think what we're talking about is a leader that feels they need to withhold information, for example, in order to be in control they're not being a real leader. Because I can tell you stuff and say, hey, you know, I'll tell you as much as I know about a certain situation or a plan that we plan on going ahead with and I'm going to ask your feedback. And um, I shouldn't have to be afraid, right, that that, that doesn't make me feel um, threatened by providing information that is sort of like, well, I should only, I'm the manager, only I should know that. Well, why? Why not share what I can with my team so that we can work together? I can involve you folks, uh, uh, you know, the team members in making decisions and kind of next step for the team and the future of the team. So I think if we, if we think about it that way, then transparent management is just all about involving the team by telling them what we know and what we can mm -hmm. when we know it, as opposed to saying, well, if I withhold this information, it gives me control or it gives me power. We don't need to do that if we're a true leader. Right. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Kurt. Yeah, of course. It was a great chat today, yeah, always. as usual, here mm -hmm. on Leader Feeder. And thank you yeah. very much to all of our listeners tuning yeah. in. I hope you learned something exciting and impactful today that you can take into your organizations. Till next time, we'll see you on the next Leader Feeder.